So, hello and welcome back to another half chapter of All the Wares of Pern. And this one I'm going to probably have to dive right into because even chopping this one in half, it's pretty long. So, if you remember yesterday, um, they're, they are definitely advancing. Um, Avis has sent set a lot of tasks. And most of Pern seems to be okay with it, with a few notable exceptions. But uh, in general, they life seems to be kind of improving for them. I mean, we did hear a little tiny bit that uh, they even have refrigerators now, which is something I don't think was ever mentioned since maybe, maybe Dragon's Eye. I think that was the last time that they had anything that heated or cooled their food that was not ice or fire. So, I mean, there are definite improvements. Um, you know, it, it does make for an interesting discussion about what would happen, you know, if suddenly a treasure trove of super knowledge was dropped on people. I mean, I think personally that the way it's handled in this book is probably the most optimistic way. There don't, I mean, there are dissenters, but it's not, um, I don't know, I just look at, like, some of our own opposition movements on any topic that comes up and think about, you know, yeah, if aliens dropped in and said, hey, we have all of this great new advanced tech, we come in complete peace, there would still be people that would not want it. We'll just go with that. But yeah, anyway, in this, uh, this chapter, which is chapter 7, we are actually jumping forward, I do believe, what is this, two turns from the start of the story? Because it started, yeah, the 17th turn. And Chapter 7 of All the Wares of Pern by Anne McCaffrey jumps us to Present Past 19. Lesser roused abruptly, opening her eyes to a darkness which suggested that daylight was still hours away. Flar lay sprawled beside her, his forehead touching her shoulder, one arm thrown across her, one leg pinning hers down. Their bed was oversized, but he invariably managed to occupy more of it than she did. In fact, there were just fingers between her and the edge. <clears throat> she must have told herself to wake up at this barbarous hour. She had always had that ability, but why? Her mind was too sleep-fogged to provide an answer. Ramoth was sound asleep, too. And Nemneth. All of Benden Ware was asleep, including, she discovered with irritation, the dragon and the rider supposedly on watch up on the rim. She would blast him as soon as she figured out why she was awake at this early hour. Then she saw the lighted clock face on the bedside table. Three bloody of the clock? Progress was a double-edged sword. Having a reliable timepiece that was visible in the dark only made the darkness and this early rising harder to endure. But seeing the clock reminded her of why she had to get up early that day. She pushed at Flar, who was never easy to wake up unless Nemneth called him. Flar, wake up. We've got to get up. Ramoth, dear, wake up. We need to be at landing. Avis particularly wants us there. She poked Flar's shoulder more urgently and, struggling to pull her legs out from under his, reluctantly rose from the comfortable, warm bed. We have to get down to landing early this morning. Early their morning. There were moments, and this was one of them, when Lessa's enthusiasm for the project faltered. If, however, this was the morning when Avis would set in motion the results of two turns of hard studying and work, then the early rising would be a minor sacrifice. In the big chamber of the Queen's Ware, she could hear Ramoth mumbling and grunting, denying the summons just as Flar was. 
Well, if I have to get up, you do too, she said, and callously hauled the sleeping fur off of her wearmate. What the? Flar tried to grab at the fur, but Lessa, with a chuckle, snatched it. You've got to get up. It's the middle of the bloody night, Lessa, he complained. We don't have fall for another day and a half. Avis wants us there at five of the clock, landing time. Avis? Flar sat bolt upright, wide-eyed, pushing his hair back from his face. Lessa snorted at Flar's response to the name. My shirt, he cried, shivering in the pre-dawn cold. You're a heartless woman. She snatched a shirt and pants up from the chair and tossed them at him. I am not heartless. Then she opened a glow basket to find fresh clothes for herself. Flar made a quick stop in the bathing room while she poured cloth for them both. With her cup in her hand, she passed Flar on her way in and then washed quickly and rebraided the ends of her hair. Watch Rider's asleep, she told him when she got back into the wear, where he was stamping into his boots and shrugging on his jacket. I know. I sent Nemnith up to scare the living daylights out of both of them. He cocked his head then as they both heard a roar and a startled squeal. That'll teach him. One day, Nemnith is going to startle one or both of a watch pair off the rim, she said. Flar grinned. Haven't yet. And then he held out her flying jacket and her cap. As she stuck her arms in the sleeves, he bent and kissed the back of her neck. <laughs> that makes me shiver, she said. But she didn't pull away, so he kissed her again and gave her a hug. Leaving one arm around her shoulders, he guided her out to Ramoth's wear. The queen's golden tail was still inside, but the rest of her was out on the ledge. And as Flar and Lessa joined her there, Nemnith lowered his head from the level above the queen's wear, his eyes gleaming blue-green in the darkness. Who did you scare awake on the watch up there, Nemnith? Lessa asked. The fall and the green grinth. They won't sleep on watch again. The bronze dragon's tone was severe, an attitude with which Lessa had no quarrel, for both Befall and Grenth were well enough on in turns not to be delinquent. Next fall they'll handle the firestone stacks, Flar said, having followed the exchange. This was no time for Bend and Ware to get slipshod. Do we have time for porridge? he asked hopefully. Considering that the days at landing were apt to be spent in non-stop work, Lessa thought a good breakfast was only prudent, even if they were already running behind. We'll make time, she said with a ripple of mischievousness. Now, now, Lessa, Flar began in a tone of reproof. If we don't let anyone else time it, Rank has some privileges, and I will think all the better for a decent breakfast in me, she said. So we'll make a little time, especially since you're so hard to wake up. She laughed softly when he protested. If you please, Ramoth. And the queen crouched to allow her rider to mount. You don't mind giving Flar a lift, will you, dearest? I don't want him falling off the top ledge trying to mount Nemnith in the dark. Ramoth turned her head towards Flar and blinked. Of course. Nemnith waited until both riders were settled on the queen's neck before he pushed off from the upper ledge and glided down beside them to the floor of the bowl. As soon as they had landed, the night lights in the lower caver caverns were visible, as well as the banked fire on the small hearth where a big kettle of porridge was simmering. The huge claw pot was pulled slightly to one side so that the contents would not get too strong to be palatable. As Lessa filled two bowls with the steaming cereal, she was glad they had the place to themselves. The bakers must have just left, for the big table near the main hearth was full of cloth-covered bread pans. Flar brought over two cups of cloth, spooning an almost indecent amount of sweetener into his and then sprinkling that much again over the porridge that Lessa set in front of him. 
a miracle you don't gain weight with all that sweetener, she said. Or lose my teeth, he told her, adding the second half of the long-standing complaint. He gave her a grin and tapped his teeth with a spoon. But I don't, and I haven't, and he dug into his breakfast. Lessa sipped her claw first, wanting to clear the last of the sleep from her head. Do you suppose that Avis is going to start on the project this morning? Flar shrugged as the question caught him with a mouthful. He gave a swallow and said, I can't think of why Elsie called a meeting of this group at such an hour. According to the original schedule he gave us, we should be ready to start. Despite what some critics imply, he said with a grimace that had nothing to do with the porridge on his spoon. Avis keeps his promises. So far, Lessa said. He has! Then Flar looked at his wearmate. You don't think he can keep his promise about Thread, do you? I just can't figure how he can contrive to have us do what the settlers couldn't. She glared at him, both relieved and sorry that she had come out with the doubt that had been increasingly bothering her. Flar covered his hand with his. He's done everything he promised, and I believe him. Not just because I, as a dragon rider, want to, but also because he sounds so very sure. But, but Flar, Lessa said, every time he's been asked, he hasn't promised that we'll be able to destroy Thread. He just says it's possible. That's not the same thing. Let's just see what today brings, eh, love? Flar said. Flar gave her a knowing look of his which sometimes she wanted to rip off his face. She took a deep breath and held back a retort. Today could prove much, and as deeply as she wanted to prove that Flar was right to place so much confidence in Avis, she had to prepare him for possible disappointment as well. If today's a disaster, that's going to reduce our effectiveness at next week's conference in Telec to choose Lord Atrell's successor. Flower frowned. I do recognize that danger. I'm reasonably sure that Avis also does. I honestly think that's why he scheduled this meeting. His timing has been nothing short of phenomenal so far. Well, he and Loidel are really into the political aspects, aren't they? I could almost wish that Loidel was still Ruatha's Lord Warder. That would give Groji the support he needs. Even I have heard the grumbling about Ruatha's young Lord Holder spending all of his time down here instead of in his own hold. At least Ranorel can't be considered too young to be a Lord Holder, Flar told her. He's in his mid-thirties and he has five children, and he is certainly the only one of Atrell's sons that's shown any initiative at all. The port renewer, renewal project of his was inspired. Flower chuckled. Even if he did add insult to injury by insisting on using Haman's stuff to build the new wharfs and to reinforce the piers. Lessa had to grin, remembering the fuss Ranorel, Ranorel, Ranorel's initiative or innovative engineering had caused among those who derided or downright rejected any useful products of the abomination. Flar scratched at his scalp and yawned. And when the other brothers tried to belittle Ranerl's project, here comes Master Ida Roland raving about the facilities, Lessa said. Well, that's not going to hurt when the Lord Holders convene. And Ranerl's mate is a master weaver. She is interested in having a power loom. I don't even know when she found out such things were possible. Lessa threw up her hands. Everybody's gone power mad. Well, it reduces drudgery. Hmm. True. Well, eat up or we'll be late. Flar grinned before he upended his claw mug. We already are. It's just as well that you're letting us time it. He laughed at the glare she gave him. 
After putting their crockery in the main sink to soak, they fastened their jackets and their caps and they left the cavern. We were supposed to be there a half an hour ago, Ramoth, Lessa told her queen as she mounted. We need to be there on time. If you insist, Ramoth said with disapproval. The others were already assembled in the main hall when the Bend and Ware leaders arrived. Robiton looked sleepy, but Jackson, Miriam, and Peemer, with Gold Farley curled around his shoulders, and the three male Green Riders all appeared to be wide awake indeed. Jackson straightened his shoulders and pulled at the lightweight sleeveless tunic he wore to free it from his sweaty back. Irrepressibly, Peemer grinned at that evidence of his nervousness. Miriam was equally nervous. The other three Green Riders, Lazal, Granat, and Slen, were shifting from one foot to the other. All present and accounted for, so let's see what Avis wants with this crew, Flar said, nodding at Lessa to lead the way. As he strode forward, he tossed a smile over his shoulder at Jackson and the others. When Avis had asked for this pre-dawn meeting two days earlier, his special students had been excited by the prospect that he intended to launch THE plan. They had been careful to contain that excitement to prevent even more rumor from circulating. Not even Peemer had been brash enough to ask Avis for more confirmation. Certainly, all of these young folk had studied diligently over the past two turns, even if their lessons and drills seemed to be irrelevant or endlessly repetitious until, as Jackson had said to Peemer, he thought he could do them in his sleep. Maybe that's what Avis wants, Peemer said. They make about as much sense as the drills he gives me for Farley. Jackson saw him stroking Farley's back as they marched down the hall and into the Avis room. The lights brightened and Peemer grinned to himself. Master Moralton's light bulbs worked just as the originals had. Yet another minor triumph for the master glasssmith working from plans of the abomination. The thought of that caused Jackson to frown. Master Norris was not the only one who had come to refer to Avis in that manner. Of course, if today truly was the beginning of the assault on Thread, that tune could easily change before there was any more to worry about the growing number of dissidents. Good morning, Avis said, at his most polite and noncommittal. If you will seat yourselves, I will explain today's project. He waited until they had taken their places, and their excited murmurs had dwindled into silence. Then, the screen displayed a clear picture of a view with which they had all become familiar, the bridge of the Yokohama. Only this time, there was an addition. A space-suited figure slumped over one of the control panels. There was an almost simultaneous intake of breath at the realization that the body was that of Sala Telger, who had died so valiantly to save the colony. This, then, was the actual bridge of the Yokohama, not the picture that Avis had supplied during their training. Then the focus of the picture slid across the consoles beyond the figure to rest on the board marked Life Support System. Jackson saw Pammer reach up to stroke Farley, whose gaze was fixed on the screen. She gave a little chirp, for she too recognized the board. She had been working for a month on a mock-up board, pushing at two toggles and depressing three keys in a certain sequence. She could now perform those movements in less than 30 seconds. Over the last two turns, Avis had subtly collected many facts about fire lizards and dragons. The most relevant fact was that both creatures were able to maintain oxygen levels in their systems for almost 10 minutes without suffering undue discomfort or harm. That time could be pushed to 15 minutes, but after that amount of time, both fire lizards and dragons 
would need several hours to recover from the effects of oxygen deprivation. One of the exercises with fire lizards and dragons, which there had been no success in, had been getting them to take an object from one place and bring it to another. Telekinesis, Avis had called it. But the concept, patiently explained, confused the dragons as much as it did the fire lizards. They would go between to get the object, but they couldn't bring it without physically touching it. Avis had explained that if the dragons and fire lizards could transport themselves telekinetically, it logically followed that they ought to be able to use their abilities to lift distant things to them. Today, Pimer, you are asked to send Farley to the Yokohama to manipulate the switches the way you have taught her to do. There is no oxygen right now on the bridge, and it is essential that the life support system be activated before we can do the next step. Another of the toggles will transmit a report on the general condition of the Yokohama. Oh, Pimer murmured softly, and then he sighed. He stroked Farley, who chirped again, her eyes still on the screen. I thought that was what you were going to say. She has been an excellent pupil, Pimer. There should be no problem, as she is well accustomed to obeying you. Pimer took a deep breath. All right, Farley, he said. He unwrapped her tail from his neck, and he held up his arm in the position that she was to take a message. Carefully walking along his arm with her tail in sheath, Farley reached his forearm and turned to face him, her eyes we wheeling alertly. Now, Pimmer held up his hand. This is going to be a little different, Farley. I want you to go up in the sky to the place that you see in my mind. He closed his eyes and he focused his thoughts on the scene of the bridge and the particular console that she was to activate. Farley chirped, looked over her shoulder at the picture on the screen, burbled once, and then closed her wings. No, Farley, not into the screen. Get the wear from my mind. Pimmer closed his eyes again, concentrating on the exact place he wanted her to go, emphasizing in his mind the life support console next to the slumped body. When she chirped again, this time, impatiently, he sighed and turned to the others. She just doesn't understand, he said, trying not to let his disappointment color his voice. Not that he blamed her. She had been to most of the places he had sent her. How could he get across the difference between traveling around the planet and going up into space above it? Especially when he didn't quite understand it himself. Farley emphasized this from, by flitting from his arm to the room in which she had been trained and moments later coming back and trying to fly into the picture on the screen. Pimer gave a weak grin. What do you want to bet she's gone and done her exercises again? That much she understands. Disappointment was palpable in the room. Pimer kept his eyes straight ahead on the unreachable view on the screen. So, Flar said, what do we do now, Avis? There was a long pause before Avis spoke. The mind of the fire lizard does not function in recorded animal behavioral patterns. It's not surprising. Your records only cover Terran types, Pimer said trying not to feel so depressed about his queen's failure. She was the best of the whole bunch, better even than Manali's beauty, who was certainly very well trained. He had hoped she would be able to make this strange variation of flight. It's just, it's a long way to ask her to go when no one's been there before. Another silence gripped the room. In fact, there's only one dragon, Flar said that's ever been off planet. Canth, Lessa said. Fedora's brown canth is too large to fit on the bridge, Avis said. It's not his size I'm thinking of, Lessa replied. It's his experience in going above the planet. He's done it, so maybe he can explain it to Farley so that she'll understand what's wanted. 
Her eyes lost their focus as she sought out Kant. Yes, we can come immediately, Kant said to Lessa. There was a stir of anticipation among those waiting in Avis's room. Pimer kept stroking Flarley, who had returned to his position on her arm. He murmured to her that she was a marvelous fire lizard, the best in the world, and that the toggles she was to pull and the buttons she was to press were not the ones in the next room, but ones up on the Yokohama, far above their heads in the sky. She kept cocking her head this way and that, her throat pulsing as she tried her best to understand what he wanted of her. Ah, they're here, Lessa said. Fenor's coming. Looking as if he had gotten dressed in a hurry, Fenor came running into the room. Can't said it's important, he said. After he looked around the room, he glanced at Lessa expectantly. Avis needs Farley to get onto the bridge of the Yokohama, Lessa said. Farley is not understanding her directions. You and Kant are the only two on Pern who have left the planet. We thought maybe Kant could clarify the instructions so that Farley knows what to do. As Lessa spoke, Fenor pulled off his flight cap and pulled off his riding gear. When she finished, his expression turned humorously quizzical. Well now, Lessa, that's a problem. I've never been exactly sure how Kant and I managed that flight in the first place. Do you remember what you were thinking? Flora asked. Fenor chuckled. I was thinking I had to do something to keep you from going to the Red Star. Then he frowned. Come to think of it, Marin was there, and he tried to make his fire lizard go. She disappeared in a flash, and I don't know if she ever came back to him. Farley's not afraid, Pimer said. She just doesn't understand where she's supposed to do what she's been trained to do. Fenor spread his hands. If Farley can't get the hang of it, I don't think any of them can. But do you think that Kant could explain to her that he went off the planet into space? Can you, Kant? Fenor asked. Kant was in the process of draping himself up on the ridge above landing where the sun would warm him. You showed me where you wanted me to go. I went. Fenor told them all Kant's answer. A planet is a bigger target than a spaceship we can't see. Farley does not understand, Kant said. She has done the things she was asked to do in the place that she always did them. Can't, Lessa asked the dragon directly. Do you understand what we're asking Farley to do? Yes. You want her to go up to the ship and do the things that she's been trained to do there. She doesn't understand where she's supposed to go. She's never been there. Jackson squirmed a little in the chair. Considering how hard Pimer had worked with Farley, it was a shame that the little thing couldn't grasp the essential point. Ruth, do you understand? he asked the white dragon. Sometimes fire lizards listened to Ruth even when they ignored everyone else. Yes, Ruth said, but it's a long, cold way for a fire lizard to go if she hasn't been there before. She's trying very hard to understand. A lot of thoughts crowded into Jackson's mind just then. But the main one was that Ruth was not too big to fit on the bridge. If his wings were folded back and he landed precisely on the floor just in front of the lift door, he would also have to remain very still, for Avis said there was no gravity on the bridge. Ruth would be in free fall. Avis did not see that as a problem for a dragon or a fire lizard, accustomed as they were to being airborne. Jackson had known that that was one reason that Avis had grilled him so long and hard on the layout of the bridge and lectured him on null gravity conditions. But until Farley had done her exercise on board the Yokohama, turning on the bridge's life support system, Ruth and Jackson, Jackson could not go. Avis had crews searching the Catherine Caves for spacesuits. They had found two, or 
rather, the scraps of fabric and the bright plastic shapes that had once serviced it. Oxygen cylinders had been made, being not too dissimilar to HNO3 tanks. HNO3, Jackson reminded himself, now that he knew the precise chemical constituents of the flame-producing mixture. But there was no protection for a frail human body in the absolute cold, airless vacuum of the Yokohama's bridge as it was now. Jackson thought of, that manufacturing proper equipment would prove to be Avis's alternative. He had already had several long discussions with Master Weaver Zerg, but alternatives would take time. Not to mention more experimentation on the part of both Zerg and Heyman's innovative crew. More time in which the disenchanted Lord Holders could steadily withdraw their support from landing. If only Farley could understand, Jackson thought, searching his own mind for any clues that he or Ruth might be able to give her. Ruth had seen the difference, but he was much smarter than Farley. He understood, as much as I do, Jackson thought with pride. What you understand, so do I. Ruth's tone was almost accusatory. It's not really a long way between, but it's up very far. Then Jackson leaped to his feet, shouting, No, Ruth, no! But he was too late. Ruth had gone between. Jackson? Lessa exclaimed, her face white. You didn't send him? I most certainly did not. He just went. Jackson was aghast, and Farley began shrieking in protest, her wings extended, her eyes whirling with angry reds. Outside, Ramoth and Nemnith bugled their own warnings. Don't, Ramoth, Nemnith, Lessa yelled. We'll wake everyone in landing, and they'll know something's gone wrong with... Then she turned to Flar, clutching at him in her fear for Ruth and Jackson. Jackson? Flar yelled, seeing the shock on Jackson's face. Miriam, her tan cheeks bleached white, had leaped to Jackson's side, as had the other three green riders, their expressions anxious, ready to support him. Robotin and Fenor were too stunned to even react, so there was only Jancis watching the screen and counting. He's all right, Jackson managed to say, though his mouth was terribly dry. The strong link with Ruth's mind had attenuated to just a touch. He's still with me. Did you tell him to go? Flar demanded, his expression so fierce that even Lessa recoiled. Jackson gave the bend and wear leader a glare. He bloody just went and did it. Ruth has a mind of his own. Then, Jancis leaped to her feet and pointed to the screen. There! He's there! On the count of ten! There, undeniably on the bridge, wings tucked tight, his whole body flattened, was Ruth. Before their eyes, he drifted upwards, peering about him with an expression of astonishment until his head touched the ceiling. Ah! Well done, Ruth! Jackson! Avis's bellow of triumph cut across the racket of astonishment and surprise that was echoing through the room. Jackson, tell Ruth not to be surprised to float. He's in free fall, with no gravity for up and down. Warn him not to make any energetic movements. Does he understand? I am. He did. He understands, Jackson said, staring in fascination at the screen. See, Farley, Pimer said, Ruth's led the way for you. But Farley was so confused by the cheering and shouting in the room that Pimer had to grab her head and turn her towards the screen in Ruth. Go to Ruth. The little queen gave a squawk and, launching herself from Pimer's arm, disappeared. Jackson, you tell Ruth to get back here right now, Lessa said, recovering from her shock. Mind of his own, indeed. I will give him a mind to obey. Restore yourselves to calm observation. Avis's voice once again cut through the noise. 
Ruth is unharmed, and Farley has found her way. Hamer let out a yelp of surprise, plainly audible in a room that had suddenly become very quiet. For Farley had indeed found her way to the bridge of the Yokohama, and, with one talon firmly hooked at the edge of the console, was diligently pulling toggles and pushing buttons. Lights appeared on the board. Mission accomplished, Avis said. They may return. Farley came, and she did her job, Ruth said, not realizing that Jackson could see him. I'm floating. Let go, Farley. It's not at all like being between. Most unusual. Not like swimming, either. It was also a most unusual sight for those observing Ruth as he drif drifted gently across the bridge, a handspan above the arc of the consoles, ducking his head to keep from knocking it in the ceiling. As Farley released her grip, she too began to float. Startled, she extended her wings and gently revolved end over end, colliding with Ruth. He reached out to steady her, and then both were pushed farther away from their original locations towards the great plasglass window at the bow of the bridge complex. Suddenly, Jancis began to giggle, and the tension in the room evaporated. I think that's quite enough clowning about now, Ruth, Jackson said, trying to sound stern. But he couldn't help grinning along with everyone else over the antics of the two creatures. You scared the life out of me. Now get back down here. I knew exactly where to go. I showed Farley. I had no problem at all doing it, and this is fun. With a negligent shove of one wing, Ruth executed a complete turn in the air and began floating back towards the lift. Will we get to come again? Only if you and Farley get your bodies back on Pern right now. All right, if you say so. Laughing with a mixture of amusement, relief, and fury, Jackson ran down the corridor and outside. The others were close on his heels, full of triumph and the laughter of relief. Lessa, however, was raging inside at the risk Ruth had taken, and she knew from the expression on Flar's face that he felt the same. Let me check one thing. Okay, I just had to make sure where I was stopping this one, because we're almost at the stopping point. Halfway down the corridor, Flar caught Lessa by the arm. You may be furious, Lessa, but we can't intervene in this, and I probably lost as many seconds as my life as you did over Ruth's leap. Ruth can't be allowed to be so irresponsible, Lessa said. Jackson isn't. I don't understand how Ruth gets away with this disobedience. Ramoff wouldn't do that. Ruth and Jackson were not wear trained. But I don't think that Ruth is going to get off easily for this escapade. Flar managed to grin. Judging by the look on Jackson's face, he's had a fright he won't forget. That will inhibit Ruth far more certainly than any threats from you and I. He gave her one of his little shakes. More important, the less fewer right now, the fewer rumors. Lessa let out a heavy sigh and glared at him and then gave herself a shake and released herself from his grasp. You're right, we don't want this broided about, at least not quite yet. But I tell you, and I will tell Jackson too, I don't want to live through another few seconds like that again. All I could think about was how on earth we would explain it to Loidel. Flar grinned. As it's turned out, Loidel can print this up as a turning point in the modern history of Pern. And won't he just? Discretion muted the congratulations for the brave venturers, but everyone patted Ruth and scrubbed at his eye ridges until his eyes were whirling with delight. When Farley finally settled down again on Pimer's shoulder, she also received extravagant pets. False dawn was just lightening the eastern horizon, so there was a good chance that very few were awake to wonder 
about why such a fuss was being made out of Ruth. I think, Robeson said, when the elation abated, that we should return to Avis. I, for one, would like to know what's next. Well, that depends on what Avis learns from the instrumentation that Farley just turned on, Jackson said. If the bridge is intact and warms up and there's enough oxygen left in the tanks to supply it, then Ruth and I go up together. He grinned. That is when we initiate the telescope sequences that will reaffirm the position of the system's planets and our old enemy, the Red Star. That was, however, not quite all Avis had in mind when late the next day, bridge atmospheric conditions were found to be satisfactory. Piemer, I would like you to accompany Jackson, Avis said when the group reassembled. I'm not supposed to go up with him on this trip. Originally, no. Two men will be needed for what should now be the first project to demonstrate proper respect for Sala Telger. It is fitting that her mortal remains be brought back to Pern and interred. No doubt Lord Larod would like to attend to whatever burial rites are currently practiced. And that is where we leave it. With the, the spaceship, the Yokohama, not quite recommissioned, but uh, reoxygenated, and they're gonna go and bring Sala home. So, pretty good, huh? I I like this chapter, and we are only halfway through it, and we are sitting at forty some minutes. So I am going to let you go and. You know, depending on which window I look out, if I look out that window, it looks like it's about to rain. And if I look out that window, it looks like a sunny day. The weather has been weird today. Anyway, I hope you guys are having a fantastic night. I did not get a chance to see the eclipse because of poor planning on my part. We'll just leave it at that. Poor planning. I woke up in time, but... I should have woken up much earlier, gotten in the car, and driven to some place where I could actually see the sun coming over the horizon because it's really hard to see the sun through trees. Little detail that my sleep-deprived brain just did not function with, so I didn't get to catch it. I am going to look up some images of it after I get done here. So hopefully, if anybody saw it, let me know. And I hope you have a great night, and I will see you tomorrow.